We're beginning a great chapter in the book of Romans, a great chapter in the Bible, Romans chapter 8. Mark uh, quoted it to begin this morning. So Romans chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. This is the great chapter on the Holy Spirit. It begins, therefore, and I'm just going to make a brief word before we read the rest of the text, but you've probably heard it said, whenever you read therefore, you need to ask, what is it there for? And the reason is because these are, this is an important connective what Paul will say is based on what he's already said. The question is, what is he referring to? What's he drawing from to draw the conclusion that he will now state in verse 1? And most likely, and I'll come back to this a little bit in the lesson, it's verse 6 of chapter 7 that he is drawing from, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that from which we were bound. That being the case, because we're no longer bound to the law, we've been released from it through the work of Christ. He writes, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit may the lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it let's bow in a word of prayer Who said, give me liberty or give me death? What document has as its goal securing the blessings of liberty to ourselves? What anthem has a line about the land of the free? If you said Patrick Henry, the Constitution of the United States and the Star Spangled Banner, you're right. All American. But the desire for freedom is not only American, it is human. Throughout history, people have valued their liberty and fought for it. At the Battle of Salamis, the ancient Greeks chanted, free your native soil, as they speared drowning Persians. People will fight for, they will risk their lives for freedom. But as much as Americans or others may pride themselves on a love of liberty, no one has freedom like Christians. Many in the early days of the church were human slaves, but they were more free than their masters. Romans 8 is about that. It begins, no condemnation, and it ends, no separation. The believer in Jesus Christ is absolutely secure, and that security gives us real freedom. Those great truths of eternal security and spiritual liberation are reasons that Romans 8 has been a source of the greatest comfort for Christians down through the ages. Someone said, if Holy Scripture was a ring and the epistle to the Romans, its precious stone, chapter 8, would be the sparkling point of the jewel. It's really impossible to find words that are too glowing for this chapter, which begins with a reminder of what it is we have been liberated from. Guilt. There is now no condemnation. Condemnation is language of the courtroom. It's the sentence passed by a judge on the guilty. In the case of mankind, it's God's condemnation of the sinner to the lake of fire. That's a terrible end. It's a terrible thing to contemplate. But that sentence has been reversed. 
There is now no condemnation, Paul says. That is freedom indeed. But it's not for everyone. It's only for those in Christ Jesus, Paul says. Those who are in Him are those who have joined themselves to Him through faith. They are believers. And Paul can give this great assurance to us because of what he said earlier in the letter. We considered this at the beginning of our reading just moments ago. The word therefore indicates that he's looking back to a previous passage and drawing a conclusion from it. And most likely, I think, and most commentators do as well, that he's referring to verse 6 of chapter 7, where he wrote, We have been released from the law, having died to it. We died to the law when Christ was condemned in our place, and he suffered the penalty of the law for us. The law's demands have been satisfied in him. Justice has been met in his sacrifice. We've been released from the law. The rest of chapter 7 is really a digression in which Paul explains the law. He defends the law. He doesn't want us to think that the law is a bad thing. So he states that the law is good. But the law is inadequate to remove sin. It can't justify the sinner or sanctify the saint. Only Christ can. Having explained that, Paul returns to his thought in chapter 7, verse 6, that because of Christ, because of all that he's done, we have been released from the law. And he then states the natural conclusion from that here in chapter 8 at the very beginning. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the first great blessing of salvation. We are free from the law's condemnation. We are absolved of guilt and delivered from the law's penalty. We are delivered now and forever. Now that is liberating and that is motivating. It is motivating when we understand the force of it. Our sins have been forgiven. The slate that was charged with guilt and charged with crimes that we have committed, charged with all of the, the, the sins that we perpetrated and, and the laws that we have broken, all of that. If you can imagine a large slate with all of these charges against it, it's been wiped clean. We've been released. We go free. If that doesn't motivate you and give you a desire to know God better and serve Him more faithfully. Well, maybe it's because you don't understand the peril you are in and how bad your sin really is. Charles Darwin was a man like that. He had been baptized in the Anglican Church. In fact, he was training for the ministry before he gave up theology to study botany. Before long, he disavowed his earlier beliefs, and he became an agnostic, and increasingly so as he grew older. But he'd never understood the gospel because he'd never understood his need. In his autobiography, he boasted of feeling no remorse from having committed any great sin. Well, that didn't mean he hadn't committed any great sin. He just didn't know it. He wasn't aware of it. He, really, he, was, he was Bunyan's Mr. Legality, moral but spiritually bankrupt. When we don't understand sin and guilt, we can't appreciate grace. Now, I don't mean to imply by that that if you don't have a full appreciation of what you have been saved from and what Christ has done for you, you're like Charles Darwin or any apostate or any unbeliever. That's not the case because the reality is none of us really have a full grasp of what we were guilty of, how deep our, the stain was, and what Christ has done for us. But we need to understand that. And to the degree that we do, we appreciate God's love and grace and mercy and forgiveness for us. That's really what Jesus said when He was in the house of Simon the Pharisee. You remember in Luke chapter 7, the Pharisee wants to have Him in, have a meal with Him, but he had disdain for Jesus, particularly when a sinful woman came in. She comes to his feet, the Lord's feet that are dusty, 
Simon didn't bathe or wash his feet, which was the normal custom, didn't have enough respect for the Lord to do that. But this woman, a sinful woman, falls down at his feet and begins weeping over them and wiping his feet with her hair. She washed his feet. And Simon looked at this and in his heart, in his mind, was full of disgust that Jesus didn't know what kind of woman this was and that he would allow such a woman to come near him. And Jesus opens his mind up. He recognized exactly what he said and revealed it to him. And he said to Simon that he who has been forgiven little loves little, which was Simon. He didn't understand forgiveness. That woman did. It's when we understand the greatness of our need and the weight of our sin and that there is now no condemnation that we love much. That is motivating. And it is liberating because it means the future for the Christian is not uncertain. We're not waiting for God's verdict. That's the way some feel. That we can never be certain of our salvation. We won't be certain until we come to the very end. And what the, a, a true understanding of the work of Christ and justification gives us is a certainty that no, we're, we're not like prisoners who have been released but are still on probation. We don't have to do something more than we have done when we put our faith in Christ. We don't have to meet some, some higher standard to gain God's approval. We're not on probation. We have His approval absolutely and completely the moment we believe. And we're joined to Christ. And we should live our lives in that way, with that conviction. Knowing that we have been declared not guilty by the judge of all men. The God of the universe. Can't get better than that. If He's declared it, it is so. We've died to the law. It cannot condemn us. And again, we have contributed nothing to that. We've done nothing to gain that blessing. It is all of the Lord. Paul explains that in what follows when he gives the reasons for our freedom. And the first reason he gives in verse 2 is the Holy Spirit. There is no condemnation because, Paul says, the law of the Spirit of life, and he's referring there to the Holy Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Well, how has the Spirit done that? By joining us to Christ. It is Christ who obtained for us salvation and all of the blessings of it. He bought us at Calvary, redeemed us from sin, Satan, and death. He obtained for us all the blessings of salvation from our faith to our glorification and life everlasting. But it is the Holy Spirit who has joined us to Christ in whom are all of those blessings. He put us in Christ by bringing us to faith in Him. And the justification that results from that faith. Forgiveness of sin and freedom from all condemnation. Now because we are joined to Christ, in Christ, released from the law and delivered from sin's penalty, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is presently living in us to deliver us from sin's power. Now that's a great blessing. Think about it. The third person of the Trinity lives, literally lives inside of you as a believer. Now, living in us to deliver us from sin's power. That is sanctification. The, the life-giving, life-transforming work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer that frees us from what Paul calls here the law of sin and death. But again, that is grounded on the work of Christ, which gives us the second reason for our freedom from condemnation, and which is really the primary reason. The Holy Spirit could only dwell in those who dwell in Christ. He can only dwell in those who are right with God. 
And only Christ could gain that position and that blessing by obtaining forgiveness and righteousness for us. His death, then, is the basis of the Spirit's life and ministry in us. So in verse 3, Paul repeats the necessity of Christ's sacrifice due to the law's inability to save. Paul returns to the Holy Spirit in verse 4, but here he reminds us of the need for Christ's death, the need for His sacrifice, and reminds us of the law's inability to save us, or our inability for that matter, which emphasizes how desperate and hopeless our situation was. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. The law could condemn sin. Paul developed this quite thoroughly in chapter 7. The law could condemn sin, and it did that. It's God's revelation of righteousness. It's good in that it reveals the holiness of God and the will of God. But in doing that, it also reveals how far short of God's standard we all fall. Paul explained that, as I said in chapter 7, that the, the law can expose sin, but it cannot remove sin. It can condemn us as guilty, but it cannot absolve us of that guilt. The law is a standard, it's not a power. We can think of it as something like a 10-foot pole that sets the standard for height. Well, the pole, the pole shows up the shortness of everybody who stands beside it, but it can't remove that shortness. It can't grow or heighten anyone. And the law is like that. It, it can do nothing but show how far short we fall of God's righteousness. Now that's not the law's fault. It's our fault. In his commentary on Romans, uh, James Stifler wrote, the anchor of the law was strong in itself, but it would not hold in the mud bottom of the heart. So Paul says that the law was weak through the flesh. The law is good. We, we just can't keep it. We can't save ourselves. Our situation was absolutely desperate. And so because the law could not rescue us, God did. Sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. Now that if you think about it, has the ring of John 3.16. God gave His only begotten Son. God gave His only Son, sending His own Son is language that indicates Christ's pre-existence, His eternal existence. Paul does not say that Christ became God's Son, but was sent as the one who was already His Son. And it is the sending that is emphasized here. Christ came on a mission as a Savior. And to do that and be that, He had to become one of us. That's how He came. That's how Paul describes Him here. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Words which Paul chose carefully here, probably to, to counter... Uh, view, false views of Christ's incarnation and Christ's person, who He was. Now, th this is important in understanding our freedom because what Christ did to gain our freedom was dependent on who He was. And so Paul is, as I said, very careful in the way he chooses his words. He didn't say that Christ came in the likeness of flesh now that would imply that uh, he, was, uh, he was all humanity, or rather it would, it would imply uh, it would, to deny his humanity by su suggesting that his humanity was not real if he was in the likeness of flesh. And that was one of the early heresies of the day. He didn't write that he came in sinful flesh either. 
that would deny his purity and deity by indicating that there was sin in him. Paul writes that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He looked like us because his humanity was both real and sinless. He was, and he is for all eternity, the God-man. Only in that way, only as that person, could he fulfill his mission of being Savior by becoming an offering for sin, which he became by dying in our place as our substitute for our sins. He had to be a man to do that. He had to be a man if he's going to represent men and women. He had to be a human being if he's going to represent human beings. And had to be a perfect man for his sacrifice to have value. Because it was in his humanity, as I say, and by means of his humanity, that sin was judged and condemned. If he had been a sinner... He couldn't have been a substitute. He would have needed a substitute, just as we did. But because he was perfect, the perfect man, he could be the substitute for men, for mankind, for others. And because he's the God-man, his sacrifice has infinite value and is able to satisfy God's justice toward a multitude of people. In fact, it's sufficient for an infinite number of people. It wasn't designed for an infinite number of people. It was designed for his elect but it was absolutely sufficient, infinitely sufficient, and absolutely efficient. It actually accomplished the purpose for which it occurred, which was to save his people. And so by condemning our sin in his son, God is able to justify us. Sin's been paid for. So we escape the law's condemnation because of that. That was only the only way that we could be delivered from sin's guilt and power. Our deliverance and freedom came at a price. Not a price to you or to me, but at a great price to God the Father. He sent His own Son, which has the, the force of, the meaning of, His unique Son. His Son who was one of a kind. He sent Him. For us. Now that shows the great condescension of Christ in coming. The eternal Son of God, the creator of the universe, became a creature, a part of the universe. He came for us. And it also it spe speaks of the great humiliation of it in his dying. And the great love of the Father in sending him for us, the undeserving. He sent his own natural son in order to make believers into his adopted sons. That was the immediate purpose of Christ's sacrifice, to justify the believer, to, to save us from judgment, to make us his people. The greater purpose of Christ's death is given in verse 4, and that is to make us a holy people. Justification and sanctification are different from one another, but they are inseparable from each other. Justification is deliverance from sin's penalty. Sanctification is deliverance from sin's power. Justification is a legal act by which God changes our status by declaring the sinner innocent and righteous. So we were sinful and under judgment. Justification declares us to be right with God's law. We are, our status is changed from being guilty to being innocent and righteous. Sanctification is the work of God whereby He actually changes our nature and makes us righteous. Those who have been justified are being sanctified. If, sanct if justification is legal, sanctification is moral. And as I say, those who have been justified are being sanctified. And so Paul writes in verse 4 that God sent His own Son so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Or, or as he 
put it back in chapter 7 and verse 4, that we might bear fruit for God. Now that is real freedom. Real freedom is not the ability to choose the right or choose the wrong. Real freedom is the ability to always choose the right. And we have an indication of what Paul means by the right or what he means by the requirement of the law in chapter 13 and verse 8 where he writes, He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Love is seeking another's highest good. Love is active. It, it does what is best for another. Paul describes it in the classic text on love in chapter 13 as among other things rejoicing in the truth and bearing all things. So as we live loving lives putting others ahead of ourselves we will conform to God's standard of righteousness. And that's a life that's above reproach. That's a life that no one can condemn us for. That was the purpose of Christ's sacrifice. To change us. To make sinners holy. And while we aren't that perfectly, and we never will be in this life, sanctification will never be completed in this life. Nevertheless, we live for that. But we do that not in our own strength. We cannot do that in our own strength. We cannot do the deeds of righteousness in our own strength. We cannot even think the thoughts of righteousness in our own th strength. We cannot have the motivation to do it in our own strength. Holiness, sanctification, is the work of the Holy Spirit. And Paul concludes on that fact. The requirement of the law is fulfilled in those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That is how we triumph over the flesh. Which brings us back to verse 2 and the work of the Holy Spirit who Paul describes as the law of the Spirit of life. Now what he means by that is the Holy Spirit works in the believer's life with the regularity of a law. That is essential in order for us to fulfill the law's requirement. It's what gives us victory over indwelling sin. The, the battle that Paul fought, that we all fight, that he described in our previous passage in chapter 7, verses 14 through 24. It, as I say, it's the battle that we all fight daily. A battle that results in frustration. In our own strength we fail. Sin enslaves us and always will apart from the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit within us. He gives us power over sin. He strengthens our new nature. What Paul called the law of my mind. Our new mind in Christ. He strengthens it. He enables us to obey and live free. He's always doing that. He's always leading us. And Paul will actually say that later in the chapter in verse 14. He never stops leading us. Now we don't always follow, but he never stops leading us and drawing us in the right way. We get off the path, he draws us back on the path. He has various ways of doing that, but he's continually with us, leading and directing us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit who is the subject of this chapter. Romans 8, as I've mentioned earlier, is the chapter on the Holy Spirit and the work of sanctification. Paul has developed justification. He speaks now of sanctification. Uh, and this is the great chapter on the third person of the Trinity. That, that's obvious from the appearance of the word spirit, pneuma, in this book. It, it occurs five times in chapters 1 through 7. The word spirit occurs eight times in chapters 9 through 16. It occurs 21 times in chapter 8. And almost always, if not always, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. Much more than any other single chapter in the whole New Testament, and for that matter, for the whole Bible. 
So verse 2 introduces the subject of the Spirit's ministry in the believer. He, begin, he brings us uh, into our freedom from condemnation and gives the freedom to live the law's righteousness. Christ bought our freedom on the cross. The Holy Spirit applies our freedom daily in our lives. He makes it a reality in our life. He has set you free, Paul said, at the moment of regeneration and faith. Sin's dominion over us is broken now and forever. That is a present reality. What a blessing. We are no longer under the reign and control of the law of sin and death. The, the constant power of sin that produces death. That's what sin does. What, what is so appealing to people is so deadly and enslaving. But the Spirit of God gives us power over it. He's called the Spirit of life because He is constantly giving life to all He has placed in Christ. He's the channel of Christ's life to us. It comes through the Holy Spirit. It is only by the Spirit that we can fulfill the law's requirement, the righteousness of the law. We're not under the law. We're not under the law of Moses in Christ. But the way we live in the power of the Spirit, we fulfill the righteousness of that law. And we do so because He is our guide through life. He is the directing power of our lives. By His illumination, by the understanding that He gives us of the Bible, of what God has revealed, Christians learn what they are to do. By His energizing work, we are enabled to do it. He enables us to know it. He enables us to do it. It's what, what Paul speaks of in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23 as the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit produces that. The Holy Spirit brings that out in us. He creates it and causes it to happen in our lives. And the first of those, of that list of fruit is love. Our love for others, the fulfillment of the law. We act, but only ultimately because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. He produces a fruitful, beneficial life in us. And that's indicated here by the word fulfilled in verse 4. It's not that we fulfill the requirement of the law, but that the requ requirement is met in us by another. And that other is the Holy Spirit. He does it. That is enablement. And that is liberation. Christian holiness is not the result of struggling to conform to an external law code. But rather it is the Holy Spirit producing fruit in our life. He produces in us what F.F. F. Bruce called those graces which were seen in perfection in the life of Christ. That's sanctification. It's conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. He's creating the virtues in the life of Christ within us, bringing it out in thought and deed. Well, still, we, we recognize the Holy Spirit is the reason for all of that, but still, we are responsible to act. We are responsible to obey. And that's, that's what Paul refers to in verse 4 as our walk, our walk according to the Spirit. And that's the, the characteristic word that Paul uses for the Christian life. It is a walk. And that word is suggestive of a number of things. It suggests a consistent life, a persistent life with a goal. It suggests steady progress. When you walk, you're normally walking somewhere. You have a goal before you. And so it suggests that. It suggests progress, very basically, but uh, not necessarily rapid progress. Uh, we, we like rapid progress. We like speed. But quickness, generally, is not what characterizes the, the Christian life. It is a walk, not a sprint. But a walk implies progress, progression, 
And the Christian life is one of constant moral advance. Now, there are setbacks. There's regression as well. That's sin. That's what it does. But that is overcome, and we do advance in the faith, the faith in the Christian faith. So it's not all defeat, as chapter 7 might imply. It is steady development. But it is development, progress, that is guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And what that says is we have a companion who directs us and supports us on the way all through life. Walks are times of fellowship and learning. We, we learn a lot about the Lord. We, we learn from the Lord and we grow in our relationship with Him. You may remember from our studies in Genesis not too long ago, in, uh, in chapter 5, in verse 22, we read about Enoch. And we're told that Enoch walked with God for 300 years, and then he was not. God took him. 300 years, he walked with God. He learned from the Lord. He had fellowship with the Lord. And through that fellowship and that walk, he gained obedience. It was obedience, and he learned obedience through it. Now again, sometimes we don't walk so well. Sometimes we stumble and fall. But the Lord doesn't become angry with us or cast us off because we've been disobedient or we haven't met His, what it, lived according to His will. Because, as we've been told, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So He doesn't cast us off. There's no condemnation for us any longer. What He does is He picks us up he puts us on our feet and patiently teaches us to walk. He helps us learn from our mistakes. And sometimes He must discipline us. That's true. We need that. But always when He disciplines us, always it's to correct us. It's to cause us to develop and continue in the right way. That's one way the Spirit, by His leading, gets us back on the right path. And the believer will continue in the right way. That's what Paul tells us. And the requirement of the law will be fulfilled in us. Not because of us, but because of the Spirit, because of God's sovereign grace. God has provided everything for His people. Christ bought us out of slavery to sin and death the Holy Spirit applied that freedom to us when He joined us to Christ and His life. As a result, it is natural for us to obey. It is natural for us to be holy, certainly to desire holiness. From our hearts, we love the Lord, and from our hearts, we love our neighbor. We've been transformed. We're different people. This is the, the affection and the attitude and the motivation that the Spirit of God creates in us. And so we are to live in that way. We are to, to walk according to the Spirit. We have been made free to do that. That's our spiritual liberation. If I can sum up these four verses, I'd sum them up, I'd sum them up this way. We have freedom for two reasons. The Holy Spirit has joined us to Christ. Christ has removed our guilt and sin by His death. As a result, there is now no condemnation. The believer is righteous in God's sight. He is legally innocent and righteous. And so the Holy Spirit can live in us and empower us to be obedient and live the righteousness of the law. Now, that is real freedom. There are many illustrations of freedom in the Bible. One that came to my mind as I was preparing this lesson was that in Acts chapter 12. Peter was imprisoned and sentenced to die in the morning. He was chained between two guards and sleeping in the night. Now, that's an amazing thing. Here's a man, he's condemned to death, and what's he do before the execution, before his head's lopped off or however he was going to be executed? He's sleeping. And someone pointed out in the first service that, that's, that, that, that he thought, when I mentioned that, of Peter the night of the Lord's arrest and betrayal. And a little slave girl turned him into a coward. Well, here he is sleeping 
between two guards, not worried at all about his death. What's happened? Well, Pentecost happened. He's got the Holy Spirit. It changed him. So he's sleeping in the night, facing death in the morning, when the dungeon filled with light, the angel of the Lord woke Peter and told him, follow me. Peter's chains fell off. He got up and followed the angel to freedom. We've been awakened. We've been freed. We are to follow. I said that the Christian life is characterized as a walk, which implies a goal, a destination. Our destination is heaven. But really, every life lived in this world is a walk. Psalm 1 speaks of those who walk in the counsel of the wicked. They will not stand in the judgment, David wrote, because they are like chaff which the wind drives away. What is the goal of your walk? Where is your life headed? To judgment or to life? Life is in Christ and we join ourselves to Him by faith. So if you have not believed, look to Him. Look to Christ. Believe in Him. He died in the place of sinners so that all who believe will not perish but have everlasting life. May God help you to do that and help all of you who have done it to rejoice in your freedom and walk by the Spirit. Well, why don't we stand and sing number, hymn, hymn number 259 in the Red Book. And can it be...